Good morning. It's uh, really a pleasure to <clears throat> welcome uh, Laura Wagner here today from uh, University of North Carolina at, uh, at Chapel Hill. Laura got her BA at uh, Columbia College of Columbia University and a PhD in 2005 at the University of Arizona working with uh, Susan Beck. Um, at Columbia College, she was a, a, a history slash sociology major, and my question is, is that helpful as a scientist to have a sociology, a bit of a sociology background? I can write papers about anything. Yeah, she can write about anything. <laughs> and, and consequently, she has written papers about anything, including high lava plains of Oregon, uh, Cascadia, the Appalachians, and, and the Andes. Um, she's won numerous awards for her teaching and her lecturing, including uh, now being the IRIS um, SSA Distinguished Lecturer, and has won, uh, I think, the student, Best Student Paper Award three times at AGU, which is no small feat. I mean, it's one thing to win it once, but to win it three times is amazing. Same paper every time? Yes, yeah, it was the same paper every time. Thanks, Alan. Um, she has a nice record of, of, of service to the community and is, a, is currently a member of the Iris Pascal Standing Committee, uh, which is the second time you've done this, I think, right? Among her research interests is uh, to use global seismology uh, for understanding the formation and evolution of the continental lithosphere. Uh, and one of the things that uh, sets her apart is uh, her interest in using collaborations uh, involving mineral physics and geochemistry to, to put these results in a geologic context. So today she's going to talk to us about can flash labs really do that? Laura? And uh, thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking the many, many people that made this research possible. For those of you who have done work with broadband seismologists who do big deployments, you know there are a million people who help out at all different levels. Uh, I won't read all of these to you because that would take the rest of my talk, but I would like to say that there are students, postdocs, collaborators, international collaborators, and of course nothing happens without funding uh, from NSF Geophysics, Continental Dynamics, and the ongoing support of the IRIS, Pascal, and DMC. A uh, quick overview of my talk today. Uh, I'd like to start off with uh, a retrospective on where this idea about flat slab subduction came from, uh, and a quick talk about flat slabs that we have to look at today. Um, then I'd like to introduce the broadband seismic data that we have for flat slabs in South America uh, that we've collected over the course of the last decade, especially in the last three years. And then some of the new results that we have coming from there that tell us not just about those flat slabs, but about flat slabs in general and what they are and are not capable of producing. And then just a quick wrap up. So flat slab subduction, a retrospective. You can't really talk about flat slabs without talking about the Rocky Mountains, the Laramide orogeny, produced these uplifts in the center of the country, and this is sort of a relatively old figure, so you know, the Appalachians and the Rockies are both folded mountains, as opposed to the block mountains <coughs> of the basin and range. Um, the development of plate tectonic theory helped with a lot of things when it comes to understanding origins. The Rocky Mountains were not one of them. They were near a plate boundary and weren't when the uplift happened. Um, with the evolution of plate tectonic theory, though, you also had people looking at trends of volcanism. So this is a paper from 1977, Coney and Reynolds. They were looking at a track that roughly went along this red line here. And notice that here on the y-axis, you have millions of years ago. And this is sort of along this track. Each dot represents volcanism. And they claim that they see this volcanic sweep that started here some hundred million years ago, went in towards the west and then back out east. And over here, you had sort of a brief period where you had very little volcanism at all. <coughs> um, as this theory evolved, this idea of a magmatic gap, a volcanic sweep and then a volcanic period of quiescence, 
evolved, and this idea of uh, an analog to what was happening in the Western US with what was happening in South America came about. And in South America, we knew we had regions along strike where there was no active volcanism. And from some of the early studies, we also had this idea that the subducting plate under these areas was subducting at a very shallow angle, and that per perhaps those two things were related. So people started to think, okay, well, maybe in the Western US, what we have is flat slab subduction, by which we mean an area where the subducting plate goes down to some depth and then goes horizontal, <coughs> often for hundreds of kilometers. In the Western US, we're talking about near 1,000 kilometers before resuming its descent into the mantle. I can't really give a talk here about flat slab subduction in South America without bringing this up. This is a decades long debate that went on from the 60s into the 80s between researchers here, so Allen and Selwyn, Arthur Snoke was involved at Virginia Tech, um, Dave James, and then the group at Cornell led by Barzangi and Isaacs uh, about what exactly was going on in this area with no volcanism in southern Peru. Really, this debate boiled down to a question about the value of local data versus teleseismic data. Do you gain something by going out there and putting out seismometers? And I think the answer that came from DTM at these early days was definitively, yes, it is worth the effort. Carnegie put out these seismic stations here in the 65, was it? Mid 60s, mid to late 60s, and recorded data that allowed them to call through and, and more accurately locate local seismicity than was possible with the global data set. The initial debate was whether or not you had a continuously dipping plane everywhere that dipped at sort of a 30 degree angle or whether you actually had a flat slab. And then subsequently, whether there was a tear between the flat slab and the normally dipping plate. I think we now all agree that there is a flat slab in much of Peru. Um, Carnegie started off by arguing that there was a normally dipping plate and then came to agree that, in fact, you had more of this type of a geometry. I'm actually going to argue that they were probably right on both counts. So I'll come back to this at the end of my talk. But I think that these early observations made with this network, looking at converted phases, might have actually been right where they were looking at. So, a bit of a teaser. Once we had this idea that the flat slabs could have caused the Rocky Mountains and could have caused the cessation in arc volcanism, people started seeing flat slabs everywhere. I see flat slabs, right? So there were flat slabs um, in, the in, the, um, in the Mesozoic. You had flat slabs in China. You had flat slabs during the formation of Pangaea. You even had flat slabs in Illinois during uh, the formation of Rodinia. There's flat slabs everywhere, right? Anytime anybody sees uh, a volcanic sweep or a cessation of volcanism or some sort of deformation inland, they can't explain it another way, they blame it on flat slabs. So, can flat slabs really do that? The theory, the sort of 101 version of the story is as follows. Uh, first, you have to create the flat slab. So some reason, the plate that's subducting shallows, and as it shallows, the normal asthenospheric corner flow that provides that constant source of hot mantle material uh, that fuels our arc volcanism gets pinched out, and it gets pinched out further and further inland, causing this volcanic sweep, and eventually, for some reason, volcanism shuts off altogether. Then while the plate is flat, you have this trapped cold material. It's now below the wet solidus, so all the water coming off that flat slab is just dumping into the continental mantle with the sphere, hydrating it pervasively. You're also somehow getting coupling between the flat slab and the overriding plate to create these inland basement cord uplifts, which is a bit of a trick if you have a giant layer of talc between the plate and the overriding crust, but never mind. And then um, some of that water also may come up and help in the formation of ore deposits that's sort of been speculated before. And then finally, at some point, the flat slab dies, comes off. And when it comes off, that asthenosphere comes rushing in and 
sizzles onto that sopping wet continental mantle lithosphere, creating a reverse volcanic sweep and a burst of ignimbrite volcanism. So that's the story. You'll hear this story all the time. It's often taken more or less as gospel. I'm not saying it's all wrong, but it's certainly worth assessing. So do we see any of this happening anywhere today? Uh, which brings us to the next point, this uh, modern flat slab is the basics. If the question is, do we have a modern analog today of the flat slab that has been argued for in the Western US, the answer is simply no. The closest analog, the analog that most people point to in Chile, which I'll talk about more in this talk, is completely different in scale and scope, both a long strike and in its inboard extent, of what we must have had in the Western US to create the basement cord uplifts of the Rocky Mountains and the extent of the volcanic sweep that we see. They simply do not compare in scale. We do, however, have a lot of flat slabs, and many of them have caused similar volcanic patterns. So, um, so here's a map. The red triangles are volcanoes, and the blue lines are subduction zones. And in places like Alaska and Cascadia and Mexico, you have a migration of the arc. The arc hasn't shut off, but you do have a migration associated with a shallow leak at the plate. And then in South America and Japan and uh, so in Peru and in Chile, you have slabs that are actually flat and where there is no associated arc volcanism anymore. The subduction zones in South America are by far the largest flat slab regions that we have today and as such are perhaps the best modern analogs to look at if we're trying to understand the Laramide. Um, so there's one in Chile I often refer to this as the Chilean flat slabs, but the Argentines are often upset with me. They prefer to use the term Pompeian flat slab. Indeed, much of the flat slab is actually under Argentina, but it's subducted under each other. I'm going to probably call it the Chilean flat slab out of bad habit, but uh, you'll hear it called the Pompeian flat slab. And then the Peruvian flat slab, which is much larger along strike, but you'll notice has about the same inward extent. Um, you have, in both of these flat slabs, you have the same overriding plate, the same subducting plate the same convergence rate and direction, more or less. Both of them are associated with volcanic gaps, so these red triangles are the uh, Holocene volcanism in the area. Um, I should say that these slab contours here are from Cahill and Isaacs 1992, so this is again a global catalog geometry of the subducting plate. Um, both of them are associated with subducting ridges, so here we have the Nazca Ridge, so these are areas of over-thickened oceanic crust. These are not spreading ridges, these are bathymetric features. Down here you have the Juan Fernandez Ridge, associated with the Chilean flat slab. Um, but they differ in their long strike extent. You can see the Peruvian flat slab is much more extensive than the Argentine one or the Chilean one. Uh, and the seismicity <coughs> patterns are dramatically different. So while in Chile, you have a ton of seismicity right on the flat slab segment. In Peru, you have almost none. You have some, but very, very little. Uh, the other thing that's different between the two is the, the evolution of the flat slabs, the recent tectonic history. And by that, I mean how long they've been stable in a given area. To understand that, you might notice that the Juan Fernandez Ridge is roughly parallel to the plate convergence direction. But the Nazca Ridge is oblique to it. So the Juan Fernandez Ridge has been parallel to plate convergence direction since about 10 or 11 million years ago, meaning it's been subducting under the same point on the South American margin for that time period. Now, the ridge is responsible in some way, and we'll talk more about this later, for the formation of this flat slab, then presumably this flat slab is also on the order of 10 million years old. In contrast, the Nazca Ridge probably started to subduct about 15 million years ago, all the way up here, and has since then been migrating to the south by simply by virtue of the fact of the difference between the convergence direction and the trend of that subducting ridge. That might suggest, if in fact these ridges are responsible for forming flat slabs, that the southern edge of the Peruvian flat slab is younger 
than areas further to the north. And so we might actually expect to see some differences in structures that represent a temporal progression of the formation and passing of flat side subduction in Peru. So what exactly can we learn from local seismic studies of regions of flat slab subduction? Um, we can certainly look at contributing factors to the formation of flat slabs. Uh, this is an important point because since we don't have a modern analog for a flat slab region as big and as extensive as that that must have been present in the Laramide, or that people argue has been present in the Laramide, we need to understand how flat slabs form to know if we can scale up the processes we see today to actually be big enough to create what we see in the Western US. We want to know certainly more about the effects of flat slab on the overriding continental lithosphere. And I think that this is really uh, the money question here. Do you get deformation associated with flat slabs? These basement cord uplifts, are those actually directly attributable to the flat slabs themselves? Do you get hydration, this pervasive hydration of the mantle lithosphere, and perhaps associated metasomatism? Um, and are there other effects that maybe we haven't thought of that we could look for in some of these paleo flat slab regions? And then finally, what happens when flat slabs come off? Is that really valid that you get this reverse sweep of volcanism? And are these ignimbrites associated with the hydration of the flat slab while it's flat? Or is this just simply a normal process associated with a retreating plate? OK. So the seismic data that we've collected. Over the past decade and change, there have been six different broadband deployments covering the regions of flat slab subduction in South America. The first deployment, which was also my first ever broadband deployment, was the CHARGE project. And so there's sort of these orange, where you can see the circle here encompasses the area, and there are little diamonds, orange diamonds, to show where the stations were. Uh, 22 stations deployed for about a year and a half um, across Chile and Argentina. Um, to follow up on that project, subsequently, another 60, uh, 57 stations were deployed in two different projects, Siembra and ESP, uh, to produce more high density data directly above the region of flat slab subduction to try and get a better image of some of the structures that we saw with the charge project. More recently, in Peru, uh, we deployed the Pulse and Caught projects. This was a 50 station caught project was designed to look at the uplift mechanism of the northern flank of the Altiplano. This is a continental dynamics NSF project, so it's multidisciplinary in scope. Um, and then at the same time, we had the Pulse project, which was designed to specifically look at the flat slab and was also intended to be co-located temporarily with the caught project. With seismology, it's important to remember that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That's something that we've really learned with uh, Earthscope transportable array data. Having all those stations out at the same time greatly improves resolution. So we were really excited to have all 90 stations out at the same time. The overlap is a good 18 months worth or so. Um, also, at, a, at around the same time we were out, um, Caltech and UCLA used their own equipment pool to put out dense transects along this sort of box here, right? where the flat slab transitions to normal dip. And so each of these transects had between 50 and 100 stations at about six kilometer station spacing. And we did share some data with them, as you'll see uh, later in the talk. For those of you who have not been on a broadband deployment, I just sort of wanted to throw in a quick slide to give you an idea of what it means to deploy 90 broadband stations across the Altiplano in Peru and Bolivia. Uh, and also in Chile and Argentina. The typical broadband setup hasn't changed much over the decades. Basically, you are creating a vault that's buried and set in concrete. Usually, we dig a hole to bury a 35-gallon drum. We pour concrete underneath and in the barrel to create a pier. We connect that to a box, usually at the surface or partially buried, that has a deep cycle battery and a digitizer. All of it is fueled by solar power. And they record to local flash drives, which means you have to go back every six months 
to check on the station and to collect the data. And the station is generally recorded for about two years so that you collect a good distribution of global seismicity. Um, each station, because you're pouring concrete, you have to visit twice in order to deploy it. And you're usually talking about a solid three person days to four person days per station to install, and that doesn't include time for permitting. So these are really, really difficult. For those of you who were involved with the High Lava Plains project, this was similar in scale and scope, except it was at 4,000 meters, and you couldn't drink the water, and there was political unrest. So <laughs> it, it was exciting. Um, so what did we get for all of that work? Um, I'll start off by talking about the causes of flat slab subduction. So one of the ongoing questions is, do ridges actually play a role in the formation of flat slabs? Some of the geodynamic modeling indicates that you can generate flat slabs without ridges. So do we actually need that? In South America, the spatial correlation is certainly striking, but it's, it's worth revisiting. Uh, here's a paper, a recent paper by Skinner and Clayton, and uh, what they do is they look at regions where you either have flat slabs or subducting ridges, or both. In green <coughs> are where you have a flat slab and a ridge that's subducting, so that's standard model. In red, you have a ridge subducting but no flat slab. And in yellow, you have a flat slab and no ridge. And I think you'll agree that it's not a particularly strikingly strong argument for the need for ridges or the role of ridges. But I would take this with a grain of salt because not all flat slabs are created equal. For example, the flat slab in Mexico, yes, it's a flat slab in the sense that the plate is horizontal for a time, but it's basically immediately sub -moho, and when it subducts, it subducts steeply. So it never goes down. You're basically just overthrusting the continental crust on top of it, with the result that the arc is simply deflected, not shut off. In Alaska, you have a similar thing. You have a very shallow but consistent dip angle and a deflected but not shut off arc. That, in contrast to, let's say, the Pumpkin Flat Slab, where this is from the Cahill and Isaac study, the plate goes down at a normal dip angle, as someone found in Peru back in the 70s, and then is horizontal, perfectly horizontal, or at least close to it, before resuming its descent into the mantle. It's in these Flat Slab regions where we see a full cessation of arc volcanism. So these Flat Slab regions are also generally associated with ridges. It's just that the end is very small, so it's a little bit hard to know just from looking at current uh, models. There are other possible contributing factors to flat slab subduction. You almost certainly need some degree of trench rollback, and the reason is that when you're creating a flat slab, you're not pulling slab back out of the mantle to flatten it. Right? You're simply failing to sink, and so if you think about this, let me do my interpretive dance move. So <laughs> if you have subduction, you can think of subduction as either the plate moving forward or the plate moving down, in which case the trench is retreating. Right? In a flat slab situation, if you want to form a flat slab without retreating the trench, you have to buckle over yourself in order to create that horizontal plane. So that would be, in this model, here. We don't see this anywhere in global tomographic models of a plate buckled over itself. So to create this sort of a flat slab like this, which is more akin to the geometry we actually see in South America, essentially you just have a <laughs> failure to sink with limited forward motion of the plate itself. And most of that motion is accommodated by a rapidly advancing overriding continental plate. The trend retreat is important, we know that. There's also potentially uh, the effect of overriding plate thickness. So this is work done by Mania et al. I just want to play this video here. The argument is that if you have a protonic keel or some sort of really thick mantle lithosphere inboard of an otherwise 
somewhat normal, perhaps slightly shallowly dipping plate. You can create a flat slab without anything else going on. Um, so here, let me just play this. So here you see basically the slab gets close to this craton here, and as soon as they impinge and you cut out asthenospheric flow, now you have a suction problem, you have a void, and the plate can't sink because nothing is coming in to backfill. And so you end up with a flat slab geometry. So this kind of impingement may well play at least a contributing role in the formation of flat slabs in some areas. In the Laramide, what do we think happened? The story is that you had the subduction of a massive plateau. It's the conjugate to the Shatsky rise. So this would be a, a large area of overthickened oceanic crust, the track of which is projected to be sort of right through the Colorado Plateau and perhaps beyond. Um, Jones et al. in 2011 suggested there might also have been some sort of a suction force created by impingement with the Wyoming Craton. Um, and then the long strike extent, at least the volcanic aspect of that, is either because this plateau was gigantic or, and or, uh, that you had a disruption of the asthenospheric flow because the asthenospheric flow was more east-west and the ridge trended in to the northeast. And so you just simply couldn't get a sphere into this area here, even though there wasn't necessarily a ridge subducting right there. So what can we learn about flat slab formation from broadband seismic data? Seismic data is great. I'm obviously a big advocate for it. But the one thing it can't do is tell you anything about the past. Seismic data shows you what exists today. But we can study existing flat slabs and see what is supporting them. So for example, we can see exactly what the geometry of the, of the existing flat slabs are and whether or not they're directly adjacent to or impinged upon the cratonic fields that are in the area. You can also look at the state of stress from focal mechanisms and see, does it seem like there's something buoyant that the rest of the plate is hanging off of? And if so, maybe ridges do play a necessary, if not sufficient, role in the formation of flat slabs. I'll tell you the punchline right now is that both the Chilean and the Peruvian flat slabs seem to show that the ridges do play a crucial role. So looking at some of this, uh, some of these results, so these are older results from the, uh, from the charge deployment in Chile. So here's the uh, Juan Fernandez bridge coming in. You have uh, this really seismically active region here, and the revised slab contours come in like this. This is the 100 kilometer slab contour uh, from Anderson et al. 2007. And you can see that the alignment with the projection of the Juan Fernandez Ridge is striking. You also have a huge amount of moment release right along the top of this plate here, perhaps because you actually have a whole lot of stresses from this slab draping off in all directions from this buoyant ridge. This is consistent with what we see from the moment tensors. So if we look at the uh, forces associated with the earthquakes that we see and we look at the tensional axes, they are all, generally speaking, pointed down dip in all directions away from the projected ridge track. Again, consistent with this idea that you have something holding up the flat slab and a denser slab draping down in all directions off of it. Uh, this is a newer study just using NEIC catalog data, and most of these t-axes here are directly in the line in the plane of the subduct plane. In Peru, it's a little more complicated. So this is work done by my student, Abash Kumar. Uh, it's still very much hot off the press. But uh, <clears throat> here we have the seismicity that we've located. Most of this is very small, much smaller than the seismicity in Chile. Uh, and a depth range from 75 to 300 kilometers. And you can clearly see this transition from a broad, flat slab at between 75 and 100 kilometers depth down to a normally dipping plate here. These green, faint green lines here are the contours from Cahill and Isaacs. Um, but notice that right here, so here's the incoming Nazca Ridge. And right where the ridge is located, 
we had the exact opposite of what we have in Chile. Instead of an overabundance of seismicity, we have none where the plate is horizontal. We have seismicity on either side, but right where the ridge is located, we don't have any seismicity. Um, right, so transition. Um, we do, however, see that the shallowest seismicity is on either side of the ridge, and it's shallower than we have in Chile. In Chile, the flat slab is right about 100 kilometers, and in Peru, it sits almost immediately uh, sub Moho at about 75 kilometers depth. It's very, very shallow. And then to the north, it deepens. And we'll talk more about that at the end of this lecture and what that might mean. Uh, this is a figure again from my student Abash Kumar showing the T axes in map view. These are his revised contours of the slab. This is very much a work in progress. Um, these are a minimalist slab geometry in the sense that they only show the geometry required by earthquake locations. The flat slab may in fact extend much further inboard, um, but the, the seismicity does not, so that's not well constrained from that alone. Um, if we look at the orientation of the T-axis, down here where we have a normally dipping plate, we have mostly east-west, so down dip extension in this area here. Um, rotating to uh, contour parallel at depths over 250 kilometers. In the transition where we're going from flat to steep, we basically have a sweep, again, following. So here it's sort of in this direction, and then over here it's sort of in this direction, basically perpendicular to the contours. Things get a little more complicated just north and south of the ridge. So this pink arrow here shows where the Nazca Ridge is coming in. To the south of the ridge, again, consistently down dip away from the ridge, just like we saw in Chile, sort of draping off of this feature. But to the north, almost all of our T-axes point trench orthogonal, which would be what we expect in a normal subduction zone, basically down dip extensional. Um, but they don't seem to be hanging off of the ridge in the same way that we see to the south. Um, I'm going to put a big parenthesis around those. Uh, in this case, I don't think that that's a reflection of whether or not the ridge is buoyant. I actually think something much more complicated is going on here. Uh, and we'll get to that when we talk, to the, talk about the fate of subducted slabs a little bit later. Um, so overall, what does this tell us? And I think that we can argue pretty solidly um, that the ridge does play a role in supporting flat slabs. Do other things play a role as well? Well, we can look, for example, at whether or not the craton uh, induced suction model of Mania et al. is playing a role. Um, we can't see that so well in Peru because we were unable to put stations far enough into the jungle um, to record where the craton comes in. Blame the shiny path for that. Um, but in, in Argentina, it's a desert all the way out, so we were able to get stations far further inboard. Um, so here, again, is a map of the stations. This is the ESP, Siembra, and Charge Project. Here are the various terrain boundaries, the Cuyanya terrain, uh, and the Pampia terrain. And then over here is the Rio de la Plata Craton. And this is the projected ridge track. Um, we can look at this by using um, a methodology called uh, Rayleigh wave tomography. Rayleigh waves are surface waves propagating well, along the surface of the Earth. Depending on what frequency you look at, they're sensitive to structures at a variety of depths. So shorter periods are sensitive to shallower structures. Longer periods are sensitive to deeper structures. And so we can invert for a 3D shear wave velocity model using a range of different frequencies that we get both by induced ambient noise and from earthquakes to get an idea of what these structures are. Um, this is work done by Ryan Porter, some of you may remember from his time here as a postdoc. And what he sees, this over here, this hunk of blue light over here, high seismic velocities are consistent basically with cold temperatures and dry material. So this here is not very surprisingly believed to be the Rio de la Plata cratonic lithosphere. This here is the downgoing plate and other complications I'll talk about later. But you can see that between the subducting plate and the Rio de la Plata Craton, you have a very distinct region 
of lower seismic velocities. These look, these look like asthenospheric seismic velocities. So you don't have that direct contact between the subducting plate and the craton. There's no reason to believe that suction was playing a role here, at least not in that way uh, proposed in that video. So from these seismic data, I think that we can pretty clearly say the ridge does play a role, and suction, at least in Chile, not so much. Okay, now moving on to the effects on the, of the overriding continental lithosphere. I don't think I have to convince many people here that the number one question we're all asking, no matter whether you're working here or on another planet, is where's the water? So many of these processes depend on that. Uh, it's crucial to understanding the effects of flat slab on the overriding continental lithosphere here, in part because if you have this pervasive hydration as proposed in the western US, and you have a layer of antigorite or talc sitting there between the subducting plate and the overriding crust, you've basically got a layer of toothpaste in there and no reason to believe that there's coupling between the two. So we'd like to know if that actually exists. Sorry. Um, this also affects the location of or the absence of volcanism. So whether you have water in areas that are warm enough to flux, to flux melting or not, whether or not you form ore deposits, and then also you may or may not have metasomatism if you're dumping a lot of fluids off of the crust into the ocean, uh, uh, off of the oceanic crust and into the continental mantle. You're fluxing that through subducted sediments as well, so you may be picking up all kinds of additional material and metasomatizing the continental mantle lithosphere. The problem is that knowing where the water is is difficult in normal subduction zones. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on this. Um, Recent work using perplex uh, to look at the stability of different hydrospaces in PT space for specific compositions has been very helpful. So here, in this figure here, it shows, uh, basically this is a degree of hydration of the colors, um, and these white lines are meant to indicate different pressure temperature paths of hot versus cold subductive plates. Uh, but none of these paths really represent the PT path for a flat slab. Um, based on this, you can get models for normal subducting plates that indicate where most of the water is coming off and how much of that might actually be being recycled much deeper into the Earth's uh, interior. But the problem for flat slabs is that we don't have a really good idea of what this thermal model is. There has been thermal modeling, so this is work by English et al. in 2003 looking at flat slabs, but there are a lot of variables. You have to account for whether or not you think there's shear heating between the plates. You have to account for the exact depth of that plate, the age of the plate, the age of the overriding plate, the thickness of the overriding mantle of the sphere. Um, most of these studies are steady state, meaning that they've evolved to the point where the temperature is no longer changing. But if you look at a temporal progression of these, um, you can see that, of course, the thermal evolution plays a big role in just exactly how warm it is in the oceanic plate and in the mantle lithosphere above it. Um, this again, this is just one paper that's looked at this. There are a lot of complicating factors, the same ones that I talked about earlier. Um, and then also you have to consider that if you're producing hydrospaces, that may in turn have effect on shear heating. Uh, and so this is sort of an ongoing cycle. So it's a complicated problem at best. We do think we know that most of the water that we get coming off at these pressures and temperatures come from hydrated phases in outer rise faults. So when a subductive plate bends to go down into the trench, you get extension at the surface and you get these deep outer rise faults that are believed to be hydrated planes of weakness um, that can extend a good 20 kilometers into the plate. So they're going through the oceanic crust and into the oceanic mantle and then being subducted and that water is released uh, at various depths depending on whether it's oceanic crust or oceanic mantle that you're dehydrating. It's this dehydration that's responsible for all of those intermediate depth earthquakes that we see in the Chilean flat slab and that we don't see in the Peruvian flat slab. So one possibility, if we want to know about where the water is, is to just look at where do we have earthquakes? 
The Chilean flat slab has tons of seismicity, so presumably it's dumping <coughs> lots of water into the mantle lithosphere above it, as predicted by sort of standard where my flat slab theory. In Peru, not so much. Why the difference? Well, one possibility that we're working on is that, as I mentioned, these outer ice faults, they go a good 20 kilometers down. The Nazca Ridge has about a 20 kilometer thick oceanic crust, which means that the outer ice fault may not hydrate much, if any, of the mantle lithosphere under the Nazca Ridge. In Chile, the Juan Fernandez Ridge is a dinky 12 kilometers or so. It's not much thicker. It's a little bit thicker than the surrounding oceanic crust. So you're probably hydrating mantle just fine in this area. Couple that with the fact that the Nazca Ridge is shallower, so at lesser pressures, and what may be happening here is that you have hydration north, north and south of the ridge, which is dehydrating north and south of the ridge in the flat slab, but that you're not dehydrating basalt or gabbro under these PT conditions, either because the oceanic crust is already completely dehydrated or because it's just in, a, in an area in PT space where very little water is being released. Not enough water is being released to trigger seismicity. Here, you have the same processes going on as you do north and south of the ridge, only with abandon. Now, why these areas are so much quieter than here may have to do with the different pressure temperature space. The Chilean flat slab being 10 million years old is probably substantially colder than the southernmost extent of the Peruvian flat slab, which is, as flat slabs go, grant spanking new, so probably not thermally evolved. But so studying, uh, I've been working uh, with Jane Connolly on some perplex stuff to try and figure out where exactly in PT space we would have to be for this to work. Uh, but it's an interesting thought that we can tell from these seismicity patterns what dehydrates where. Um, okay, so in terms of where's the water, in the case of Chile, so I said, you know, we should be having lots of dehydration because of the um, huge amount of seismicity that we have in the flat slab. We can look for that in the overriding mantle lithosphere by looking at seismic wave speeds. It turns out that hydrospaces generally have very low shear wave velocity. So sorry, the x-axis here is shear wave velocity in kilometers per second. And the y-axis is the ratio of p-wave velocities to s-wave velocities, the v-p-v-s ratio. And Tigerite, talc, common hydrospaces in the mantle have really low shear wave velocities and generally high v-p-v-s ratios. Though I should note that recent work on talc has dropped the v-p-v-s ratio to about 1.6, emphasizing the point that a lot of these studies were done in the 70s and really could bear <coughs> revisiting. So to anybody who's actually interested in studying elastic properties of the upper mantle, I encourage you to do so. Um, your normal peridotite is over here, sort of around 4.5 kilometers per second, and the VPBS is maybe 1.78. Uh, so adding water to that should be fairly distinctive in terms of seismic wave speeds. To look at that, uh, in Chile, we performed a body wave tomography, so this was work that I did uh, using the charge data. Basic idea being that you have earthquakes in the subducting plate, you have seismic stations at the surface, and if you have a low velocity zone in the middle, then every wave that tra travels through it is going to show up late. You map this out in 3D for both P waves and S waves and the VPVS ratio. And in Chile, you get a result that looks like this. So this is P wave velocity. S wave velocity and the VPVS ratio. Um, the contours are in kilometers per second, so this is 8.2 here, 4.7 here, and 1.7 over here. And for the most part, you can see, so here's a cross section from A to A prime, fairly normal P wave velocities, around 8 kilometers per second. Really high shear wave velocities, 4.7, 4.8 kilometers per second. And of course, if you have high VS and normal VP, and you divide them, you're going to get a really low VPVS ratio on the order of 1.7. Now, anybody who does seismic tomography will tell you that the error bars are huge and poorly quantified. I could not agree more. However, 
you can get a sense on how much you can push these bounds, what's actually required by the data and what isn't. And I would say the highest you can push this VPVS ratio is to maybe 1.72. Most people I have talked to would argue it's significantly less than that. So that puts us down over here instead of sort of up here. And even if you take talc down in this direction, you're still not getting that high shear wave velocity. So in any case, the lithosphere above the flat slab in this area is dry, period. It's dry. And then there's the question of, well, what is it? Your normal peridotite has a VPVS of 1.78. How do you get a VPVS ratio that low? So aside from the water question, this brings up uh, sort of an intriguing <coughs> issue. I was incredibly comforted when other people found similar low VPVS ratios in other areas so that I didn't completely think I'd just made this up. In Alaska, where we have that really shallowly dipping plate, they find a region of VPVS that they argue they know for certain has um, values lower than 1.7. They are usually arguing for something like 1.68. That's incredibly low. Um, They've come up with a bunch of different arguments for what's causing this really low VPDS ratio over the years. This is uh, work mostly by Jeff Avers and Brad Hacker. Their most recent argument is that because they're using body wave tomography and most of their waves are vertical, this high shear wave velocity they're seeing is due to a radial anisotropy where horizontally displacing shear waves have higher velocities than vertically displacing shear waves. And so actually you're just seeing an anisotropic signature. You're not actually having really high shear wave velocity to low VPVS ratios. Don't worry about it. It's normal mantle. Except that it's got this weird anisotropy. You can actually test this because it turns out that Rayleigh waves sample vertical shear waves and my body wave tomography samples those horizontal shear waves. And this, the overlap between the two is straight. So this is Ryan Porter's work, and this was my work. And uh, these are sort of scaled so that they overlap in longitude. And you can see that where I'm finding these really high shear wave velocities right in here, not only are we both seeing high shear wave velocities, we both get the same value. We both get about 4.7, 4.8 kilometers per second. So this is incredibly consistent. No evidence for radial anisotropy at all in Chile. So this is a real feature uh, that continues to be perplexing. Um, if you look at this a little bit more closely, again, going back to the mineral physics data, there's a huge amount of variety in what we think we know about the elastic parameters in PT space for upper mantle phases. So this is just looking at iron and magnesium M members for your typical peridotite. This gray box here represents some, with somewhat generous error bars the results that I have in Chile. And you can see that the only values that come up overlapping with this would be enstatite, so the magnesium M member for orthopyroxene. I'm not actually arguing that we have a, a giant block of pure enstatite above the flat slab, but it is intriguing, um, in part because you can get enstatite by adding silica to olivine. You could get silica from all of the subducted sediments that you have in the region if you flux water through it to bring that silica in through that mantle lithosphere. So perhaps one way to get silica enrichment in the continental mantle lithosphere is by flat slab subduction. That would be really interesting. The only problem is that you need water to get the silica up there. And then why doesn't that water metasomatize immediately into talc or antigorite, depending on whether you actually have uh, instatite or olive oil? Uh, I don't know. So the skinny of it is, where's the water? It seems like from the Rayleigh wave tomography, the water is being released once you start getting to the very outboard edge of the flat slab, but it's not getting into the mantle directly above most of that high, plane, uh, high seismicity, high moment release plane of seismicity. Um, there are a bunch of theories for this, not the least of which is that because you have this bending, perhaps the <coughs> crust is under compression, and so the water can't get out of the oceanic mantle lithosphere, and it's kept in it until it bends down, and you get extension in the crust, and the water come out. That's one possibility. It's very arm-wavy, because we don't know. 
recent geoelectric models in the area do suggest up here, once you get past where the plate resubducts, you have an area of high conductivity. That could suggest that you are having water released from the subductive plate at much greater depths. It's just too deep to actually flux melting that reaches the surface. Um, so what have we learned? Water is not pervasive in the continental mantle lithosphere above the South American flat slabs, either because you don't have continental mantle lithosphere, as the case in Peru or in Chile, for unknown reasons. Um, not having water makes it easier to understand the formation of these basement cord uplifts, because you don't have this weak, weak layer between the horizontal plate and the overriding crust. But it makes it much harder to understand this post-flat slab ignimbrite flare-up in the ore deposits that people associate with flat slab subduction. We may or may not be having some metasomatism over the overriding plate. This is an intriguing problem we've been banging our head against for ages. Um, but maybe this hydration occurs as the flat slabs are actually dying. Which brings me to my last point. I'm running low on time, so I'll be quick. The fate of flat slabs. This reverse sweep that people have talked about in Laramide was not so very pretty. Um, it certainly was not as linear as it looked in that original Coney's paper. And so there have been a wide range of ideas on exactly what the geometry was of the Laramide plate when it came off. My favorite is, uh, is this fairly fanciful one by G. Humphreys, affectionately known as the taco model, though not by Gene, um, <laughs> where it sort of droops off and you have this volcanism coming in on either side. There are also versions that are the exact opposite, where the sides troop off. You can pretty much name it. People have come up with some sort of a, an elaborate geometry to explain these volcanic trends. In Peru, you have this intriguing possibility that you have this ridge passed, and I've just tried to convince you that, in fact, the ridge plays a role in the formation of this flat slab. So the areas to the north, maybe they are no longer supported. Maybe this is an area where we have a dying flat slab. Indeed, if you look at, so this is now a zoomed in scale from, um, from 50 kilometers depth to 140 kilometers depth. And you see here, they're very shallow seismicity south of the ridge. Here's the absence of seismicity associated with the ridge. And then north of the ridge, you start off with an area that has a wide vertical range in seismicity, a sort of bifurcation before you get this sort of broadening here, and significant deepening of the earthquake locations. How do you deepen this flat slab if it's a flat slab? How do you get material in above the flat slab without breaking it to allow that deepening to even happen? You have that suction problem that we talked about in the formation of flat slabs going on right here. So this is intriguing. We have other lines of evidence to look at this. One is shear wave splitting. Um, looking at shear wave splitting from local earthquakes, we see a distinct trench parallel fast direction north of the ridge and a much more heterogeneous set of shear wave splitting south of the ridge. If you look at that just sort of schematically, here we have this ridge. It's immediately subcrustal. Here we have trench parallel well-organized fabric north of the ridge and this complication south of the ridge. I can't say I know exactly what it means, but again, it's, an, it's evidence that there's difference between this flat slab and this region here. Receiver functions can tell us things about the locations of discontinuities. Um, red indicates an increase in seismic velocity with depth. Blue indicates a decrease in seismic velocity with depth. This is a transect here down to the south and south of the Nazca Ridge. And this is an area here along our northern transect near Lima. And if you just look at the interpretation, I can kind of go back and forth. Here's the base of the crust. Here's the oceanic lithosphere. And then you have this sort of offset here. And the interpretation is that you either have a break in the horizontal plate, or perhaps you actually have a dipping plate there. It's a little bit hard to see, and dipping reflectors are really hard to see in these types of receiver function profiles. But we can look at them with Rayleigh wave tomography. And so this is very hot off the press. This is work from my student, Sonia Knezhevich Antonievich. And she has been looking at Rayleigh waves across this flat slab region. I'm going to show you a bunch of profiles 
This black line here shows you where the profile is, and I've got the earthquakes projected on about a 20 kilometer window on either side of that transect here. Um, darker colors are higher shear wave velocities, lower colors are lower, I'm oh, sorry, uh, lighter colors are lower shear wave velocities. Um, and so starting with the normally dipping plate here, you see this dipping plane of seismicity. And as we move north, the plane of seismicity shallows, as does the high velocity zone. You then have this sort of high velocity slab. Notice that it looks like the slab does extend significantly further inboard than the seismicity. Moving further north, to just north of the ridge, this complexity here we're still working on. Uh, where the ridge is located, we have these really low velocities. That may be from the over-thickened oceanic crust that we expect to be pervasively hydrated, or just slow because of the salt. And then just north of the ridge here. So now here's the ridge, just north of the ridge, getting back into this seismicity. And we have this funny low velocity feature here. We have a cluster of seismicity in this high velocity body here and a dipping plane here. And as we move north, there's a gap between the two, associated with this low velocity anomaly, and something that looks like a steeply dipping feature. Now, the seismicity does broaden inboard, but it sticks to the areas of higher velocity. And this profound dipping feature here is robust all the way further north. So in combination, if we have this dipping feature in the Rayleigh waves, we have this sort of dissected feature in the receiver functions. We have something that looks like organized trench parallel fast directions above the slab from the anisotropy. We have, remember, this change in the t-axis rotations from the earthquake locations. And we have the problem that the earthquake locations deepen to the north. We have to explain how that's even possible. And then we compare it to the work that Selwyn um, and Hasegawa did back in the late 70s and early 80s. So this is one of their transects. This was at the point where they were arguing, okay, maybe the plate is actually flat. But this stippled area here was where they were seeing these converted phases. And the argument was that you had to have a dipping reflector to get those converted phases forming, and they need to be in this depth range. This is about the same transect. It's uh, right around the that's a little bit south of there where we have better resolution. And it's scaled to be uh, exactly the same. And I would argue that that is a fairly striking correlation. So I actually think what we may have here is a break in the plate and a reinitiation of normal subduction to the north of the ridge. So in the area where you were looking, because uh, they were studying NNA, which is at Lima, this is specifically looking at the area north of the ridge, whereas all the other studies were integrating earthquake locations over the entire area. So it may not be very seismically active down here, but I do actually think there may be a velocity contrast associated with the new initiation of the subjective plate. OK, and I've gone way over time, so I'll just leave our summary up here, and I'll take any questions. in the state of stress to compare the rest. 
So that's sort of the going theory on how you get intermediate depth earthquakes at all. Um, where that water goes after it's released, well, that's another problem. So if you're making lots of serpentine, you're making something pretty slippery and it won't be able to sustain stress. It seems to, though. Right? I mean, otherwise, if you just had a stand of continuous deformation along these outer rise faults, you wouldn't see any earthquakes anywhere in those depths. Like Peru. Yes, but Peru is unusual. Most places have significant seismicity at those pressures and temperatures. There are a few exceptions like Cascadia, but there you have a really freakishly hot plate that has sort of an unusual geometry also. Yeah, yeah. So these, <coughs> excuse me, these bridges that are subducting, I mean, are they just overfitting crust? But what is in that crustal pile that gives it the buoyancy to keep it from subducting? Do you think that if you had a thickened crustal pile that got to a certain depth, it would actually increase the negative buoyancy of the spot? Right. So um, the ridges themselves are sort of uh, hot spot tracks, if you will. Some of them form at the ridges themselves, which is why they have conjugates on the other side, which is why we have some guesstimate about where they are at depth. Um, the thickness of the crust, we actually do have active source profiles that give us some con constraint of what we're looking at. And it looks like, in general, the Nazca Ridge, for example, is 20 kilometers thick. The bottom 12 of that is gabbro. The top is basalt. Underneath that, you then have a Harzbergitic layer that is also less dense than the rest of the uh, slab. In terms of, at some pressure temperature condition, that basalt, let's say, converting to eclogite, I think you're absolutely right. But eclogite, the trans, the uh, base transformation to eclogite is slow, and you need water, free water, to do it. Um, there's an interesting point to that, which is um, uh, if you look at how long it takes for a flat slab from the time the ridge enters the trench to the time it resubducts at the far end of the flat slab, in both Chile and Peru, that time is right around seven to eight million years. If you do the math and you back out basin and range extension and you look in the western US how far inboard the flat slab probably went, although there's a lot of error bars on that, and then you look at the incredibly high convergence rate that you had during the Laramide, you get the same amount of time. Now, that could either be something about the thermal evolution, or it could be that that's just how long it takes to get a, a high enough percentage of that basalt to convert to eclogite that it becomes negatively buoyant and starts to sink again. So if you've got a system where you're subducting thick and crust mm -hmm. and ridges, but you also have a system that requires uh, suction to kind of hold the, the, the slab there, I would think uplift history would tell you a lot about what's going on. I know you're looking at a snapshot today, but what, what, is, what is uplift, how, how does uplift, uplift, uplift history play into these two different kind of forces? Yeah, uplift or, or subsidence, as it right, were. Sorry, right? So, right, so in the Western U.S., that, that argument has precisely been made that you can, if you look at the basins themselves, you can see evidence for this suction force as the flat slab is progressing inward. That's uh, actually the main argument made by the Jones et al. paper that I showed that one figure from. That indeed, when you get that impingement with the craton and you get some suction, you get these basins across the Western U.S. and it can put time constraints on those. So that's actually a very nice constraint that does suggest that, in fact, somehow that flat slab may be pulling some areas down. So, do I look at gravity in that? Um, the problem that we have is it's not there anymore, right? So the, the flat slab, the Laramide flat slab, isn't attached underneath the western US. It seems to be completely gone. Uh, and the Colorado Plateau still has a mantle lithosphere, but that's a whole other cup of tea, and that's probably not the plate, it's the actual Colorado. Depends on how old the flat slab is. So you may have a progression 
you might actually expect the flat slab to widen um, as it gets older simply because it's colder and colder and colder. Chile is really low, it's like 25 milliwatts per yeah, yeah. Um, meter squared. And then you have, um, in Peru, the few measurements that you have are low, except for one, just west of Lima, that's yeah. really high. And everybody's always blown that off as like, oh, it must have been near some, ge ge you know, some geothermal flow or a hot spring or something. Nobody's really ever paid any attention to it. But it is sort of funny that the one place we have a high heat flow measurement above a flat slab is the area where I'm arguing the flat slab is no more, and where you saw that dipping reflector. So, right. melting in flat slabs is that you have such a cold thermal regime that you're well below the wet solids. So we, we know that arc volcanism is shut off. We know that um, we're at least not getting any melt at the surface. Seismic melts would be also extremely slow in their velocity. So at least in Chile, you definitely don't have any partial melting. Questions? Now let's thank uh, Laura again.